Hello, everybody. Welcome to Late Night Craft Talk. We're about to start the show. Yes, we are. It's going to be so much fun. You guys are going to like seriously just enjoy hearing about the ASU Powwow and us and talking to Tawny. It's going to be great. Yeah, we're going to have it. We got Tawny Baker, the coordinator for the Powwow at ASU tonight on our show. This is going to be a cool interview. All right. Savea, I think it's 10 o'clock, isn't it? Oh, it sure is. Let's count down. All right. Let's count down because it's totally 10 o'clock on Friday night. All right. You ready? All right. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Showtime. It's time for Late Night Craft Talk with hosts of Aya Kamori Yang and James Hermes. On tonight's show, Tawny Baker, the coordinator for the POW at Arizona State University. President Obama once visited a powwow at Standing Rock Reservation. You know why he probably hasn't been back to another reservation powwow? Too many people were asking him to babysit. It's time to start the show. I hit the right button right there. There we go. How you doing, Savannah? Doing good. Are we going to have a video? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, let me guess that language. Let me guess that language. The bunnies. The what? <laughs> you're a la 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 la. I'm guessing the language there. Savanis. Savanis. Okay. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry. Yes, it is. Nailed it. Okay, cool. So are you ready to talk about uh, your business this week and how it was? I would probably be better to talk about my business than me talking about your business. Yes, it's probably. Or do you want to talk about your business? Because it's none of my business. I mean, it isn't any of your business, but we could talk about your business first. Well, I'd rather talk about your business first. Okay, then we'll talk about business. Your business is a lot more interesting than my business. My business is just business. Well, okay, so we had. That was funny, crazy actually. <laughs> we had a funny thing that we did this week uh, on our website. We had an Easter egg hunt on our website. And it was crazy fun. <laughs> it was fun. So we basically did, I hid lots and lots of Easter eggs all over the website. And uh, I found out that there were lots of people that really enjoyed it because they all looked around for them, found them and bought them. So we had a pretty cool little Easter egg hunt and it's been taking us, it's gonna, we're probably going to be done with shipping all the Easter eggs out on Wednesday. That's how many orders. It was crazy. We were just running around getting our Easter eggs all around. Right They're all over the store. We just like had to go pick all of them up and we had to go put them all in packages. It was crazy. So all the Easter eggs were found, right? Yes, we did find all of them. We made sure to check off the list. So either you people were that in find. People were that determined to find Easter eggs or you just are not very good at hiding Easter eggs. I think that it was kind of like one of those situations where we just poured the Easter eggs all over the floor. <laughs> right. Poor or bunny. The <laughs> what the bunnies for? <laughs> it was fun though. It was fun. I always look forward to doing that. And we're going to do more of those this year because people had so much fun doing that, that we're going to do it again. You're going to do more Easter egg hunts? Not Easter egg hunts. There can be called other things. July 4th uh, uh, eggs? Maybe. Halloween eggs? Maybe. Labor Day weekend eggs? Maybe. We might be inventing something, but it just doesn't have the same tone as Easter eggs. Yes. So we'll we'll see. We'll I'll announce when we have, you know, when we figure out what we're going to do. We'll be announced. Okay. So now I got to talk about my business, right? Yeah, you got to talk about your business because it's none of my business. It's none of your business. So I'm going to talk about my business. I will air my business. But not my dirty laundry. It was, it was laundry day this morning, so we, we I don't have no laundry. Talk about your dirty laundry, honestly. Well, it's all clean laundry now. There is no laundry. Okay, okay, that's good to know. Okay, all right. Got it. Good. Okay, I think we're done with that part of the kind of questioning. All right, uh, start working on stuff. Uh, new things for some shows coming up. We, I have two shows booked for this year, so far. Oh yeah. Lakeside Rodeo, the end of August. I don't have the exact date in front of me, but 
basically that last Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of August, the weekend before Labor Day weekend. You'll see us at Lakeside Rodeo, and we will be at the Bulls Only Rodeo uh, the weekend of August 8th. It would be Friday night and Saturday night. We're at the Bulls Only Rodeo. Shows are booked. We got it. Cool. So that's happening. Possibly also Pauly Rodeo. Uh, we'll be announcing about uh, Barona Palace will be over there uh, Labor Day weekend. I'll be announcing that probably uh, toward the beginning to middle of May is when I'll know because that's when they'll probably know to announce. Yes. That means the sign of power has to return. And that is such a huge thing right now. I've also been napping arrowheads. Look, it's just automatic. I say napping arrowheads. savannah has got to do the same joke every time. It's so funny, though. <laughs> K-napping. K-napping. How about that? Should yeah. I, go? I don't have the points in front of me. I could go grab them. You, you want to grab them? Go grab them. I'll go grab, I'll go grab a few. I'll show some points. Savea, entertain the audience. I will give you a topic to discuss. The Industrial Revolution was neither industrial nor revolution. Discuss. Okay, guys. Hey, guys. Okay, so James is gone. So we should seriously, like, totally, totally like, razz him because he's not even going to be here this weekend. Okay, that's why we have to pre-record this show. I don't know if you guys know it's pre-recorded. So, Totally just need to start saying all kinds of nonsense things about James. <laughs> Be funny. Let's see. What could we say? Oh, you, should, you know what? We should talk about how James is. Um, okay. You do know. The audience already knows the show's pre-recorded. I'm going to know what you said because I edited this. But to be fair to you, Savea, when we get to this part of the show, I will just close my eyes and my ears and just let it be done. I will see no evil, hear no evil, or I will see no Savea, hear no Savea, but I will speak about Savea. Yeah, okay. Okay. I made three obsidian ouchies. Yeah, those are pretty scary. Like, you could really make holes in people with those. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I was up, because uh, I want to get these finished before I leave for the river, you know, this weekend, hence the show, why the show's pre-recorded. Um I was up at like five o'clock this morning, finishing off of these so I could turn on knives tomorrow. And, you know, I was up early. I think I was up a little too early because it definitely bit me in a few places this morning. <laughs> Obsidian. Not sharp, fun. sharp volcanic glass. Not fun. My, my ouchie right there is, uh, is proof. Okay. With that being done, I think it's time for, uh, it's time to move on to the interview, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I'm really excited that we have Tawny on. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but I help um, work at the ASU powwow and I've worked there for many years and I've worked with Tawny for many years. And um, this weekend would actually be the ASU powwow if we were doing it this year. Whoop! There's my screen. It's I crazy. miss you, Sophia. I miss you. <laughs> It's You're crazy. back. I, I miss my Palo family. My hands. I was doing like this and just kind of like fiddling with my little elastic on my my finger, and I tapped the, I tapped the, <laughs> hide the video. So it's uh kind of an exciting uh or it's kind of exciting that we're going to be doing something, um in place of that for this year. Um and we have some announcements that um Tony's making towards the end of the interview. So you guys are going to like to hear that information. So it's going to be great. Um, but I just, I've worked at the powwow for so many years. It's just been weird. Like we haven't had the powwow for two years. So. Yeah. Um, shall we go and introduce this week's guest? Yes. Let's Let bring it up. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome this okay. week's guest. Tawny Baker, coordinator for the POW at Arizona State University. Yay, Tawny! Yay, Tawny! And welcome, Tawny! Welcome to Late Night Craft Talk. It is fantastic to have you. Thank you. Thank Hi, you so Tony. much for joining. I'm so happy that you could join us. Tawny's a longtime friend, and I consider my sister. So, <laughs> anyway, okay. Yes. You consider your sister, but you never say I'm your brother. Well, I mean, I guess you could tell her you feel like. Well, no, it, it, neither, my mom wouldn't claim either. So, <laughs> as we've learned. Yes, this is true. This is true. Yes. So, 
it's true. We give each other hard times all the time. And Tawny's seen this many times. Even like in just the beginning, we're like, yeah, okay. So anyway. You're probably getting the idea that even off off the show, we still pick on each other just as much. It's not an act. It's terrible. It's terrible. I could one of the things we love is bring on bring on here and you know, so they have known each other so long. And and um as I've talked to uh, people to be guests on the show in the over the uh, next couple months that are from the spring powwows. You know, it's like three minutes of conversation, 20 minutes of just catching up. We mm -hmm. miss our Powell family so much. Yeah. And just the committees, the dancers, everybody. And, you know, it, Powell's are supposed to be a bit of a family gathering and get together. It's a big time family reunion when they start up here in Southern California. And just, you know, being able to have you on the show with Savea is just, I'm sure it's just uh, right there. It kind of fits the meaning. I know we actually get to see each other this year. <laughs> So yeah, because this weekend, this would have been uh, the weekend where we have the ASU powwow in Arizona this weekend. So it's kind of like a, an appropriate time to have Tawny on as a guest. Absolutely. Now, now, how long have you two known each You met through ASU powwow or the powwow at ASU? Yes, yes. Okay, how long have you known each other and how long have you both been working with the powwow? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Do you want to start, Tawny? Like more, le, more, more than more than one year, less than fifty. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so I started working at it at ninety in ninety five. Twenty six years. Yes. If we include twenty in twenty twenty one. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yes, and I worked with Tani's dad Lee for many years, and really nice guy, kind of like my powwow dad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> powwow dad to many. <laughs> Yes. So, and Tony, how, how long have you been working with ASU Pow Wow? Oh, geez. I've been involved all of my life. Um, first, as just a dancer, a participant, um, just always around the Pow Wow. It was just a great family gathering, something we looked forward to every year. Um, first, when I was younger. And then um, later on, helping out with um, head staff duties, I was the head judge. Um, like 2007, 2008. Um, and then eventually um, when my father passed away, uh, my husband and the rest of our family as well um, decided to take over the coordinating, you know, efforts and duties. Um, so like really super involved um, starting 2014. So, yep. But otherwise, like I've been around it all my life. I remember it as long as I can remember dancing there, having fun, visiting, hanging out with family and friends. Um, and so, yeah, so my involvement became more and more um, involved throughout the years. So, so in, a way, in, a, in a way, if you look at it a certain way, you're like second generation involved in running the powwow. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Standing. How many years has ASU powwow been going on? Um, so the last time we had it in 2019, that was the 33rd annual. That's been many, many years. Yeah, definitely more than one and less than 50. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, so Tawny, tell us about um, your like feelings of powwows. Like, how did you start? Like, I mean, obviously your family's been involved with powwows, but what are your earliest memories of just going to powwows? Um, geez, my earliest memories were just, um, going with my mother and father. Um, I also have a brother, but he wasn't too involved um, way back then. Um, just going around to the local powwows in the area and kind of getting to know different people, um, mostly my dad, you know, kind of making connections and um, expressing to them that I didn't want to dance and participate. So they, uh, you know, my dad reached out to friends that he knew that were involved and said, okay, like, how can we do this? Can you help us out? Um, and so, yeah, just going and observing and seeing how everything kind of happened, occurred. Um, also my mom, um, she's been like a seamstress kind of all of her life. And so just going and observing, you know, the different outfits and how things were made and created and what it all entailed. Um, so yeah, like, just doing that kind of stuff at first. Um, remember my mom making my first, um, I started as a fancy shawl dancer. And so uh, my mom 
sewing and, and making my outfits and creating and doing her thing to encourage and, you know, um, yeah, encourage that participation and, and wanting to be involved. So they were always so supportive of me, like all my life throughout um, getting involved and um, learning how to make the different types of outfits and regalia and all the pieces that are, you know, included. Um, so yeah, they've just been very supportive and continue to support me. And then as I went on and had children, you know, helping my kids out and getting them situated and always sewing for us and, and creating and taking us around traveling. Um, that was a huge thing too. So yeah. Yay. So you met your significant other at a powwow. I did. Um, yes, I met my husband Darnell at Sam Manuel Powell in 2000. So Sam Manuel is um, special powwow too. Special powwow, special special gathering, special time of the year for us as well. Um, so yeah, I met him in 2000. We've been together since then. We have three um, beautiful children, and um, he also grew up, you know, around. Powell Trail, his, his father and his grandparents and his family. Um, his grandfather was one of the original um, Mandaree singers. So from the Fer Fort Berthold Reservation in North Dakota. So his family very involved like all throughout their life as well too. So that's just, that's how he grew up as well. Traveling, going to powwows, dancing, um, being involved like for as long as he could remember too. So and then now we do that for our kids. So same thing with them, you know, my kids, they all dance since before they could walk, you know, still carrying them around and, and their little outfits. Um, and then just growing into it and being involved and participating and um, yeah, building, you know, their love for it. So how, cool. how, how, how neat is it to see your kids at ASU Pow Wow? dressed in to dance in the arena, knowing that, you know, your father was involved. I assume your father, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Your father was involved. Short memory. Whoopsie doos. But uh, your father is involved. And now that your, your kids are there and dancing, just how, how on the scale of coolness, how cool is that? It's extremely cool. So, right. um, yeah, I mean, they went through the motion, same as me, um, like, participating and just being there and dancing um, and then eventually kind of stepping away from participating and dancing into like helping out and supporting the committee um, as as they grew older so wanting to be involved to help out like my son loved to um, drive the golf cart around and you know haul people <laughs> into the powwow entrance um, from the parking lot and picking up trash every night crawling under the bleachers um I forgot about that. I'm like, <laughs> so, I don't know yeah, if that so, some vents I've had to run into. That's a lot of trash. Yeah. So they went through like the same motions and experiences as I did too. First, just like dancing and just participating as a dancer. And then eventually just kind of like being support staff and um, just really growing up with it the same way that I did. So I think well, that's like, super you cool. know, one of the big advantages about, about growing up around powwow, I mean, literally growing up around in a powwow around powwows. A lot of aunties and uncles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lots. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Never short a babysitter at a powwow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what's really cool is the evolution of the ASU powwow and how it started. Because I remember back in like 95, like we didn't have walkie talkies. <laughs> and I was like, when I met like the next year, I'm like, seriously, I made a list. Okay. We need to do this. We need to do this. Like, I was like, these things need to change, you know? So the next year we had walkie talkies. Well, you mean you, you, you started old school. You, you would go over, you'd make a decision. You'd have somebody uh, in the golf cart going or skateboard or whatever, or a little red wagon going, Hey, cross arena. <laughs> Time to start grand entry. It's yeah. only 20 after four. It's, it's crazy, like how it's, it's grown so much and, you know, moving the, seeing the powwow develop over the years where we had like, was it like a two, a two, three person riser? Like we had two of them. And then <laughs> we went from that to like 
huge, these huge, like huge grandstand, like seating areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the locations changing and stuff. So. Yeah, definitely. A lot of changes. Um, yeah. And I've seen how that all worked out the location, um, the changes to the structures of the field that we used to be in. Remember we had that huge field. Um, then they built, um, you know, athletics practice facilities. And then we kind of slowly like, got into a smaller space. <laughs> smaller and smaller. Yep. And more hidden mm -hmm. and less parking. Mm hmm. Oh gosh, parking. <laughs> so, so, so that sounds like the Belmont. I think you just described a couple of rodeos I've been involved with over the years, watching stuff get smaller. Mm -hmm. um, so, what you you are Powell, you are a coordinator for the Powell ASU. What does that mean? What is that? Oh, okay. So, um, what does that mean? Wow, that means so much. <laughs> um, I, I, I must have brought asked too broad a question, <laughs> more than I thought, because I instantly regretted it. Do you mean to rephrase it? <laughs> what do you do for the powwow? Okay, so what do I do for the powwow? Um, I think along with our small group, we really, the planning committee at first in the early part of the year um, is a lot smaller. Um, we coordinate with ASU, um, all the various departments that we needed to work with, um, confirm the dates, confirm the location, um, confirm, you know, potential funding that we receive from ASU as well, because they do um, help out financially a little bit here. Um, start deciding who we want to invite for our head staff. So our host drums, our master of ceremonies, our arena director, our head judge, um, figure out hotel accommodations, um, honorariums for our head staff. And then we then move into vendors um, applications, what that's going to look like, how we want to make that be, you know, the spaces, the availability, um, releasing those to the vendors. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. Um, prior it, it, to it's almost like three, it's almost like three events or, you know, bringing, bringing together a small town and event community over one weekend or running three different events in one forum, powwow, mm -hmm. vendors, then there's all the logistics, like you said. What departments are you working with at, with ASU to bring this? To, to make this um, athletics, um, parking, uh, the president. So you like security, security, security facilities. Yeah. Um, police, um, health and safety environmental health and safety. Yeah, a lot of different things go into it. Um, I was a lot more involved in that process when we were at the um, the band field. And then once we made, made that move to the stadium, um, there were individuals that took that over and I was less involved. So that was fine with me, <laughs> less work. Um, and I could focus on kind of the more um, bigger and also smaller details of the actual powwow itself versus all of these like event planning logistics. And I think a lot of people don't realize like ASU really, really wants to support this powwow and they don't realize like ASU like really rolled out the red carpet for the, for the powwow to be at the stadium mm -hmm. um, because that's like their most precious location on campus it's precious it's like super precious <laughs> that has got to feel so i mean honored or humbling or anything to have the uh, the, the uh, university back the powwow that much we've been around we've seen where universities go oh it's a powwow they just treat it like any other you know they treat it like just some whatever student union body event don't give it much care it's not a, it's not a big football game who cares but the fact is they put that much effort and support behind a cultural event, a native cultural event is damn nice. Mm -hmm. Damn nice to hear. We've seen some that are not very cooperative with their, with their native student body. And it's cool. It's very cool to see this. 
Yeah, and then our powwow in 2019 was the like the first cultural event that would be held in the Sun Devil Stadium. So it was a huge deal for us to be able to um, host the powwow there. Um, they actually approached us as well too, like they wanted to host it. So um, there was huge renovations that occurred with the stadium and this um, push to make it more of a, of a community center um, to host all sorts of events and activities throughout the year, rather than just um, football games during the football season. So um, yeah, we were very super lucky and honored um, and appreciative that they like approached us and said, hey, this is what we wanna do. Would you consider coming here working with us? Um, so yeah, it was, it was really okay. cool. Now you're, I know what you have is a year round commitment for the power, for the power coordinator. What typically, when, what, what is your two weeks look like after the powwow? <laughs> I know there's a certain period of decompression, but you got to do an eval and follow up right after the event. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, certainly. Yeah. And Savea also plays a huge role in this as well. Um, as well as the other committee members who are very involved throughout, you know, the whole process. Um, yeah. And yeah, so just kind of, it used to be Sunday night, we had to pick up trash, we had to clean up everything, we had to wash dishes for the fry bread stand, like gather all of that equipment and everything. Um, the U-Haul truck. Mm -hmm. Taking up extra storage, you know. But um, so this past, the first in 2019 when the power was in the stadium is like we didn't have to do any of that and we like didn't even know how to act or what to do with ourselves <laughs> so um we were able to go have you know dinner and just really talk about everything that happened and um process it all again kind and like make notes of things we had already thought about um ideas what have you for the next the next year so um so yeah i think Having it in the stadium um, takes care of a lot of that stuff that we it won't have. It sounds like after so many more. years, you were finally spoiled a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so um, we can really like fine tune some of the things we want to do and the goals we have for the power. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the first two weeks. Now, when does uh, you know, there's always a certain period, a few weeks, a couple months of decompression? Just go, it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, in the palace, typically in April. Mm -hmm. middle of April, end of April, when does the cycle pick up for the following year? After a couple months or 10 um, months out, 11 months out, 10 months out? Yeah, I would say probably in the fall. So um, like September, October, I guess, is yeah. probably when we, I, I try to round everybody together once again. Savea usually likes to round people up and say, hey, what's going on? We need to talk about this. And so, um, so yeah, like trying to, again, figure out head staff, make sure our dates are set, um, start meeting with, you know, each other and, and figure it out the plan for, for how to move forward. Mm -hmm. And it's the closer you get to April, the more you go, all right, or you go <laughs> ripping hair. A bit of both. I'm sure it's a bit of both. I think that a lot of people don't realize how much effort, how much time, how much love, how much like just pure, like pure heart goes into these events. Um, it, it's, it's so exponential what needs to be done. To make well, let me, lead. let me, let me, let me, let me, let me twist this interview a little around. Let's say I'm going to interview you and Tawny as both of you being the, I assume the core the current core there has been for a while for ASU powwow on doing this two members of the core how long has the core been together you know I mean has it been like one central group for 20 years or so or we've known each well Tani and I worked a lot more together um, when she took over the powwow but okay. she was always involved with the powwow before so I, I know but I'm saying you've always got a core group you've got a core group that does it mm -hmm. how many years has your core group been working together on this powwow um, I know it's not 33 years, but I'd say like 20. Yeah. 20 years. It's mm -hmm. been the same small group of people for pretty much actually more than like, as long as I've been doing it, I've been, I know a lot of the people that have been there have been around this whole time, a large percentage of the people. So it's has a small any, group. Has anybody burned out? Well, I mean, sometimes I don't know some of them are staff that they don't work for the university anymore. Got it that happened like where people they just weren't there the next year 
Yeah. I know it's or kind of an odd of... question, but I'm actually building to something here. Like you, you, you largely you get your groups that are kind of kind of like you know afraid, but they stick with it, right? Yes, mostly I say pretty much everyone is just they're there. Mm -hmm. They're there because they're dedicated to the love of powwow. Mm -hmm. That's what I was building too. I was hoping to go a little more elegantly, but it wasn't quite working. <laughs> I was like, I guess they're me, me and the word elegant are antonyms. I was like, building up to what? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, like I said, being elegant or antonyms here. <laughs> I tried. I tried. Yeah. So, but it's it's really like we just we put a lot of love into the powwow, and and every year like we do it in memory of Lee. We do it in memory of of all the people that have worked at the powwow, um, and you know, there's been really great um, head staff like Lee, uh, Sammy. Sammy's been gone for a few years and it's, you know, but he's always been, you know, every time I see pictures, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's Sammy. So. How many, to turn it over, what are some of the, your favorite head drums you worked with or do you, is that cool to ask that? Um, yeah, certainly. So I think, well, since I, I mean, I always love bringing in family. Um, so my husband's family's drums have come in, Mandry, Young Bear. So it's really a good opportunity for um, his family members to come in and visit as well too. Um, Black Bear, we had them 17 and 18, I believe. Okay. Um, so they're from uh, Manawan, Quebec. So um, that was really great to host them and have them come in because uh, a lot of the singers actually only speak their um, native language or French. Mm -hmm. So they're French Canadian. Um, so that was really, that was really neat. And just, you know, being around that and, and, and hosting them and trying to make sure that everything was well. And, you know, um, that was really fun. Um, Cozad is always a great time. Stony Park. Um, yeah, like, I think my dad, uh, before I came on, my dad really kind of prided himself in um, bringing in different drum groups, like every year from like, like new and upcoming to try to like really, you know, build them up and support them. Um, and also really creating um, like family relationships with them over the years too. So, you know, I've just always heard great stories um, from drum groups and different power family of the hospitality and the good caring that they received, you know, when they were here. Um, so yeah, I'm always thankful for that. Yeah, I remember, uh, I remember being a one power, you know, they, they, it, it, I'm sure they love the reception you have and, and just the, uh, I won't say the perks, but you know, the, your, your, your sincerity for loving having them there and you wanting to take care of them. It just reminds me of a just off topic here just for a minute. Remember when Powell, they took a lot of pride in what they're doing as a small reservation. Uh, first time we're actually trying to run a Powell, they went with all locals. They brought in, you know, the local tribal members to be the committee and bring it in. And they'd really never ever done a gathering like that before. Brought in, uh, you know, pretty good, well-known arena director and whatnot and uh, their head staff. And um, it was kind of way a pretty rural area. And I just remember the arena director looking at his lunch going, you know, and, and including all the head staff and, and everybody at their bologna sandwiches. <laughs> I never, just the look of the MC going, the, the MC going, this, like, I've got two bologna sandwiches. He's like, all right, <laughs> this is classic. But, you know, a lot of pals didn't have different events. There's uh, some that will have, you know, the switch, you know, uh, switch dancers, that'll be their fun thing. Uh, Spotlight 29 has their, Powell Iron Man with the with the immense fancy. Uh, what really cool events are unique, or do you really enjoy seeing at ASU Powwow? Um, I think the highlight of our weekend is the Tiny Top Grand Entry. So um, we saw this happen at Saboba cool. Casino Powwow actually um, for the first time, and so it was just you know a procession of of all the young ones dancing in their own grand entry they even had their own little flags um 
And it was just the greatest thing ever to see. And so my dad really loved that idea. And he was like, we should do this at ASU. Uh, so that's where that idea came from. It's from Saboba um, Pow Wow. And All so, right. that, yeah. that is cooler than the puppy bowl, okay? <laughs> it's really cute. The little kids are so adorable. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's kind of the highlight. That's our, our Saturday night live, um, as we, we get into the event. So Saturday night, so that starts us out. So, um, so yeah, like just love highlighting, you know, the, the younger generation, the little ones, um, create a space for them too. And yeah, like honor them. And mm -hmm. so what's been your favorite specials? Cause I know that like we've done at the powwow, we've done some special, things like i know that we did like a cowboy thing once we had teams and did, did you do a boots and hat special mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ah, awesome i've yet so to see what, that in california what was your favorite one of the years did you remember because there's a lot of really fun ones yeah we've had a lot um of different things happen Jeez, i don't know if i have a favorite um my family like yeah my I, I i would say the cowboy um dance special that was hosted by um daryl goodwill the first time we had it there so his family put on that special so it's a cowboy and cowgirl dance um for adults and it was it was just really neat to see because that's when um that became more popular in powwows and we we're seeing a lot of that you know happening more um so yeah i think that was probably one of my favorites um so yeah because for a long time the only time I had seen that special was in North Dakota um, at the Mandarin Celebration, North Dakota. That's like years and years ago. And I thought that was just the coolest thing ever. Like we had never done that around here. Um, and eventually it became more popular and um, done a lot throughout, you know, all the areas of the United States. So mm -hmm. that's really cool. <laughs> yes. So James, do you have any more questions? You know, it's just been a great revisiting pals and just hearing the talk and uh, I miss the hell out of it. It's really. weird though that we haven't had powwows because like Tawny, like last year, I'm like, gosh, Tawny, right now, what will we be doing? <laughs> we were running around, running to get this, running to get that, getting ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember last year. In this garden, lots of gas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember last year at this time we were like, oh, we would be doing this and the weather was so beautiful like it would have just been amazing like mid 80 degree weather all weekend it was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, but you, if you're bringing if you're importing drum, if you're bringing in, you know, invited drums from from Canada and whatnot and they come down to the mid 80s, you might as well just slap them in Death Valley in August. <laughs> I've had friends that come down for Indio Powell when Indio Powell used to happen at the end of March every year. Mind you, Indio Powell is like eight feet below sea level. <laughs> you know, it's hot. And we, I had a friend come from, upper, uh, her family came from Upper Peninsula, Michigan, Mononomy Reservation. And it was 82 degrees and she's lying in her booth like this going, how do you people live here in this hell? <laughs> it does get hot in Arizona. Mm -hmm. yep. It's really hot. It's the way it yeah. gets hotter in Indio than Phoenix. No. I don't think so. We get into the contest about this sometimes. No. <laughs> I, think that, I think Phoenix is so hot. It's like, okay, you know what? I just thought of this. You know why Phoenix is hotter than Indio? Because because it's not? Because the, the population of the amount of people driving their cars, turning on their air conditioner units, you know, you know, driving everywhere. Then you have like just all that crazy of all those people breathing out air, you know, and then it's all the sun. It's like, okay. If you look at just that population of Phoenix versus the population of Indio, that makes it much hotter. No, actually, you know why it's Phoenix? You can definitely tell the Indio's hotter than Phoenix because if people got, got their choice between the two places, they definitely go to Phoenix. It's <laughs> That's why the Phoenix is so much more bigger. Uh, logic, logic, Savannah, logic. No, I don't know. I don't know, I, I don't know if I can agree to that. You, you disagree with logic? Okay. Believe in your force thing with your light up light stick called the lightsaber. Mm -hmm. Science. We've had, we've had lights Logic. lights on together. Tony. We're, we're talking around talk here now. 
<laughs> oh yeah, we got to interview Tony. That's right. We got to get back to this. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Tony. <laughs> So what do you look forward to um, for the next year for the powwow? Yeah, so I'm super excited. Um, I think, you know, we got to see as a committee how the powwow looked and was and felt um, within that space. And also um, the stadium, you know, the, the department, the staff that we work with from there, that was essentially, uh, I think for a lot of them, their first time being at a powwow and let alone hosting one. So it was a really good learning experience for everybody so they could actually see how it all worked together. Um, and then also really noting how we can make really great improvements for 2022. So um, yeah, so seeing how it all works together and figuring out, okay, how can we address this issue or that issue or what have you and make it a better experience for everybody that's there. So um, I'm really excited for that. We have some really great ideas for improvements, um, some plans as we move forward, um, head staff that we have in mind already that were supposed to be ready to go you know, for 2020, but that didn't happen. So um, yeah, I'm just really excited to gather once again and come together and be in that space and celebrate and be with everybody. It's really, and that space has so much room to grow mm -hmm. and be and just an amazing, it has so much potential and it is, we're really aware of, you know, really making it a great space for the powwow. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's just so much growth and it's, it's going to happen and it's planning, we're planning on to make it happen. Do mm -hmm. mm -hmm. thumbs up. I just have, you know, as we're getting ready to wander the wind down the interview here, um, I, I, I just remember this. A friend of mine, and this is probably 25 years ago, 28 years ago, uh, said, and I think it was ASU Powwow, he described it used to be an event called Indian Car. And it's not really the song, but people would have to bring out their old beat up trucks out onto the uh, field. And if it didn't make it under its own power, it, it, uh, you know, it was disqualified, but it basically brought out for the ugliest truck contest. <laughs> and it, it, ha it had to be registered. It had to be, it, it had to be registered, current registration. It was it called the Indian Truck Contest. Is that, do you all remember anything like that? No. Okay. <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> I, I, I haven't heard the story. The friend's been passed away a very long time, but I remember him telling the story from of SU Powell a very long time ago. And I'm like, or Powell in Arizona, I'm wondering if it was that powwow. So. Hey, maybe I just gave you an idea for a new event <laughs> or you bringing back a new, a, a, a favorite event. We never know. We could take it to consideration, right, Tony? I want to enter on my F-150 in that one. <laughs> well, if, if, you, if, you announce a, if you announce a contest and you see somebody going over and starts buying a bunch of bumper stickers, you know somebody's getting ready to enter that contest. <laughs> nice, nice. Okay. A little bit of bailing wire. Yeah, so thank you so much, Tawny, for joining us. And it was really nice to talk about the ASU powwow and talk about Lee and talk about your family. And it just was really nice. It's almost like, oh my gosh, this weekend, it's like almost, you know, having the memories and the, the good feelings for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Yes. Thank you for asking me to join. It's great to connect with you. Um, yeah, so we will share that we are scheduled for April 8, 9, and 10, 2022 at the Sun Devil Stadium. So um, stay tuned, more information to come. Yeah, we will see you over there. Thank you. Yay. Thank right, you. Thank you, Tony. thank you, Tony, so much for being on the show. Hi, James. Thank you. Bye. I'm just really happy that we got Tawny on. She's such a great person and I've worked with her for many years and just, I'm just really happy that we could actually have this on, you know, this video is going to be put on the powwow ASU. That's awesome. Yeah. I just missed talking shop. This powwow, that special, this powwow. Uh, I, 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 my particular favorite has always been boots and hat and the broom dance specials, yeah. but y'all do the boots and hat special. So that's awesome. But, yeah. you know, it just it makes me kind of hungry for some of the food from powwows. I know. There's such good stuff. Oh, my goodness. What's some of your favorite food from powwows? 
I always love the fresh roasted corn. I love that. It's so good. Mm -mm. How about a, how about a fry bread burger? Oh, I like that one. Well, it's just like glut, gluttony and one in, in, wrapped in wonderfulness. It's so good, and you just like get lots of lettuce and tomatoes and onions in there, and just like this huge burger. I know it's like it's like it's like. It's like, a, it's like a Texas bun. He's huge. Yeah, usually it's funny because my um, my we actually had that the the hamburger at the ASU powwow, and I liked it, but I like to split it and share it with someone because it was like two patties, and they folded. It was like it was so big. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I just like a good a good fry bread with a, like some sweet or actually raw honey for me personally. I like it. With the raw honey, is that is the bomb? I love that. Well, that actually, you know, that's a lot like beignets. Who? Beignets, you know the the New Orleans food where they have like the the dough and you put the powdered sugar and the honey. It's Wait, like we're talking fry bread and palos, not Cajun who New Orleans. <laughs> Did you already forget the focus of the show, Savannah? Oh, I just was saying it's similar. Jeez. Yeah, I, actually, there was a friend of mine that texted me last night because. I was cooking fry bread last night and seriously, let me, let me look this up real fast. Okay. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Here we go. I was showing, I texted her a picture of the fry bread I was making last night. Okay. And she says it is similar. She goes, looks good. I said, fry bread power. She goes, and she goes, yes, similar to Tunisian fricasse. Is that how it's pronounced? Hmm. F-R-I-C-A-S-S-E. Fricasse. Fricasse. Tunisian fricasse I made yesterday. We should compare recipes. Yeah. And she says it's her tr uh, traditional end of Passover meal because Passover just ended mm -hmm. for those of the Jewish faith a couple days ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, where she, she says she made it for her kids, but her kids would rather have had pizza. <laughs> but everybody, you know, uh, those from Nor Norway may call them scones. Mm. <laughs> I was at a I was at a truck stop once. I had to haul some kids with me, and they're from Southern California. We're going over to a, a, a function over in a, a Colorado. We're at a truck stop, and one of the kids goes, and there were some native kids, and they go, "Hey, fry bread! There's fry bread in the breakfast buffet at the truck stop." I'm like, "Actually, that's called scones." It sure, it looks like fry bread. You know, actually, um, it's funny that you say that, but um, in um, in China, they have a dish called a Chinese donut. And it's actually like a dough that's like, it has a very similar flavor to, to fry bread and it's puffy Yeah. and they eat it in their soups. And then also they cover it with sugar, just sugar. And it's like a donut. Wow. Well, you know what? It all started with the native, with, with natives in North America. Exactly. Because we started the fry bread thing. Everybody else goes, oh, we'll call it this. We'll call it that. No, fry bread started here. Now, each of you from each, in each native nation, may start individually taking credit for your tribe starting it yeah i know well you know there's a lot of different variations i know that oh, yeah. some people really prefer eating fry bread that's made with bluebird flour and some people prefer making it with flour flour really all i use is flour have you made it yeah and i made it with bluebird flour and it tastes really good you did like once didn't you? you've only cooked it once right no, I cooked it two times. Two times, got it. I, I used to do three or four times. I tried cooking it, but tried making it before, and I wasn't very good at it. the last times that I made it. I made it with bluebird flour, and it tasted really good. So I don't gotcha. know. Maybe it was the recipe because lots of there's lots of different recipes out there. There's family recipes. There's recipes on Facebook, on YouTube, everywhere. The, the flour definitely makes a difference. When I for I used to do classes in the nineties up in Ottawa, uh, which is a mountain town above Palm Springs. And I would do, I would do demonstrations up there and we would cook fry bread for 30, 40 people. I'm used to cooking big batches of fry bread. Yes. Probably the, the biggest one was a function down at Bobo Park in San Diego where my family and some friends came over to help out. And we cooked fry bread for 420 people. Wow. For lunch. That was 30 pounds of fry bread wow. dough. It was a lot of, a lot of fry bread. It's haunting my dreams, but 
Everybody's got the recipe. I think, matter of fact, us being the informational show that we are, entertainment and informational, you think some people might want to learn how to make fry bread? Yeah, you know what? I think that it would be very interesting to see how you do it. Uh, everyone, like I said, everyone kind of has their own variation of how they do their own fry bread. And actually, maybe you have some tips that they can use to, like, expand their expertise. Well, I am known as the, uh, you've got Superman, Batman, Aquaman. I am fry bread man. <laughs> I shall exercise my power. Ladies and gentlemen. Fry bread man. Fry bread man. I, mean, I seriously need to get that blue shirt with the shield from smoke signal it's says fry, fry bread, bread power. power. <laughs> that shirt will never get old. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we shall, I shall exercise my superpowers and teach how to make fry bread. Yay, fry bread. Woo! Hello, Late Night Craft Talk. Are you missing the powwow season? Are you missing the smells and the aroma and the tastes of powwows? Well, not to fear. I'm here to help you make some powwow comfort food. I'm going to teach you how to make fry bread. All you need to make fry bread is some flour, baking powder, not baking soda. Don't do that. I had a friend who did that once. He was going from all the salt, but baking powder, just a little pinch of salt and mix it up in the bowl and then you're going to fry it in vegetable vegetable oil or lard okay what we're going to start doing is we're going to put some flour in the bowl so we're going to do a couple sp things of flour now i don't have exact measurements i just kind of go by feel and what looks like uh looks like it's about right i'm going to do a small batch of fry bread right here so i'm just going to do a couple of scoops here and now i'm going to add and like i said this is really unscientific. I just go by feel on this one to make my awesomest fry bread. We're going to do just a little scoop like that of baking powder and probably do a little bit more if there was a bigger batch. But This is a small batch but I don't want to go crazy on fry bread. We just do just a little dab of salt and that's probably too much. So I'm going to take some out of that but you can see the little bit of salt. That's actually too much. I'm just going to do three quarters of that put the rest away. Now, that's ready to go. Here comes the messy part. Water. So I'm just to add a little bit of water. And we're going to mix it up by hand, because that's what I'm used to doing. You want to mix it up by hand, right? Yep. Okay. The way you taught me to do it. That's the way I taught me to do it. Add a little bit more water. Now you want to add a little bit of extra flour. Matter of fact, what I didn't do was add a little bit of flour to your hands like this and that helps keep the dough from uh, the dough from sticking to your hands so a little late but we're good so we haven't used up the water the flour yet so add a little bit more and the thing is is that if you add too much water you can always add a little bit more flour which makes more fry bread see now I want to do this on purpose I want to show you I added way too much water look at that dough way too runny so we add a little bit more flour and, uh, you know, you definitely could be washing your hands after this. So we add a little bit more. And that's still really runny. But, you know, it doesn't take much flour to get it just right. Now, mind you, this is the first time I've probably done fry bread in about a year and a half. Definitely since the pandemic started. But comfort food. That's still a really, really runny. We basically want to get at this point is to add flour to the point that the flour is no longer being absorbed into the dough and that tells you when it's about right. So here we go. We're actually getting there real quick because you can see the dough right here is not sticking too much. Actually and here we go. This is muy, muy bueno. This is good. This is what we want to see. The dough is pliable. It's not sticking to my hands. This is exactly what I want to see. So that's enough to make, you know, that's enough to make a few pieces. We're just going to go ahead and roll it through the flour here a little bit more. Make sure it's all absorbed because there's still a few spots that needs to happen. Okay, now you can start kneading it if you want to, to get it ready. But you want to have the dough give a chance to kind of settle for about, you know, five, ten minutes. Play by ear. The bigger the batch, the longer it's going to need to settle. This small bit is just going to need a few minutes. So 
We're gonna let it settle, get kind of flat, and I'm gonna go heat up the oil, and we're gonna cook some fry bread. Mm -mm. Now I'm gonna add the vegetable oil into the fry pan. You want a fry pan that's a minimum a couple inches deep. So let's get that in there. Before I do that, let me use up the rest of this little bottle of it. So we're gonna pour it in. You want it, what do you say, a couple inches deep? Yeah. You want it a couple inches deep. About an inch, inch and a half. I'm getting that from my uh, off-camera off advisor, even though I'm the one that taught her to make fry bread. So we pour a little bit more in here. And it's kind of a wasteful to use a lot of vegetable oil, but that should do it right there. Okay, that'll definitely cook it up nice. Now we're gonna heat it up. When you turn on the oil, turn it on high. You want the oil probably about five minutes to get it warm enough. Ideally, when you put the fry bread in, you want to... two minutes is enough. Okay, my off off camera advisor told me two minutes. But anyway, you want it just hot enough that when you put the fry bread in, you basically count to 10, flip it over, take it out, and it's golden brown. That's a really hot oil, but not enough that it's going to you know, do spontaneous combustion and then you know burn your house down. That would be a bad day, but it makes good fry bread. All right, the dough's just about dry enough, so you want to take some extra flour, put it on your hands, rub it around so the dough does not stick to your hands. And let's grab a little piece right here. Let's start forming it. So, you want to uh, take it and start spreading it out a bit. Still a little damp, but we think we can work with this. We're gonna make kind of a small piece right here so you get an idea. Form it out. Some people I know like to put a hole in the middle like that so that it cooks a little more even through there. But if you put a hole in there, you try to make a fry bread taco, it'll fall out. That's bad, unless you just stick your mouth underneath and just use this as kind of a funnel to eat the food. But let's go ahead and spread it out a bit, looking good. Oh, still a little sticky there, but you can work it out. A little bit more flour on the hands to keep it from sticking. Let's try it again. Probably let it sit for a couple minutes, but like I said, I think we'll be all right. Okay, spread it out, a small piece. That's looking good. All right. Just put a little bit here. You want to don't let it get too thin in places. All right, we got a piece right there ready. Let's get ready to throw it on the oil. You want to take a small piece of the dough and just lay it in the pan to check the temperature of the fry bread. That's looking real good. It's turning brown pretty quick. That means the oil is about ready to go. There's a mini piece of fry bread. Kind of turn it over here a little bit. Call that a appetizer. Yep, yeah, that's just turning golden brown pretty quick on the edges. We are good. All right, go get a bigger piece. Let's form this up. You want to get it going. It's just the perfect set and just long enough. It's forming out real nice. Let's get that piece there. Spread it out and we'll make it. Don't let it get too thin in places. I'm trying to keep that in the camera. Okay, that's looking real good. Now you just want to just lay it in the oil. Don't slam it down because that oil will get on you and it'll burn. It'll not be a nice day. So there it is cooking. Wait till it gets kind of golden brown along the edges. That'll tell you when it's time to flip it. And that's looking good. Okay, it's starting to get it brown along the edges. Let's flip it over. I probably did that a hair too early, but we're okay. There it goes. Does not take very long to cook this. What do you say, for late night craft talk crowd? Or as also as Maya calls it, the Friday crowd, you liking what you see? Let me know in the comments. Oh, that's looking nice and brown right there. Ideally, you should just put it in, see it till it's brown, brown on, you know, kind of golden brown on the edges, flip it over, and then boom, done. It's kind of different for me. I'm used to doing this in a Dutch oven over a fire, not on a fry pan in a kitchen. Looking good. Just kind of see the evolution of the color there. It's 
give it just a hair longer. Flip it over on this side. Oh, yep. This side's definitely done. That'll be the last flip. And oh, you can almost just literally see it turning gold. And let's just go just a hair longer. There we go. Mmm, fry bread. Lots of cholesterol too. <laughs> The fry bread is cooked and is looking awesome. Now, you already know about Indian tacos. I've already mentioned that, but here's how you can do fry bread as a dessert. You take some of this and you can either add some powdered sugar to it, to the top right here. And there you go. Real new, good looking, take a bite. Or per my personal favorite and kind of roller style to do it is you take some honey you put on top of the fry bread. That is called perfection. Just take a little bit here, a little bit of honey. Runs quick. Add it to the top of the fry bread. Add it there. Just need a little bit. Take a bite. Mm -hmm. Oh! Pow wow comfort food. Okay, this is good stuff, but you gotta be careful to, if you're cooking fry bread. Don't post it to Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or any of those because your neighbors, whomever, you will have complete strangers sneak in to steal some of the fry bread. So watch out. Be careful. It'll just disappear. You got to watch out for that. This is a valuable, valuable, valuable commodity food. Mmm, fry bread. And that is how you make fry bread. That looked I'm pretty good, Jane. Bread. But you know what? what was really interesting? Who's hmm. that person that snuck into your kitchen? What person that snuck into my kitchen? What are you talking about? There was someone that snuck into your kitchen and took one of the fry bread. You are just trying to make me paranoid. I swear. Audience, audience watching, leave comments for Savea saying, no, you're just trying to make James all paranoid and it's not going to work. No. Yes, I pulled two jokes on you at last week's show. Well, I pulled one joke on you. I'm not playing a joke. I'm serious. Go watch the video again. <laughs> I will do that. I will watch after the show. I will go watch the video and we'll talk about it next week. Okay, watch it. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. So many wonderful ways to make fry bread. So many uses. Yes. For fry bread. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So I was thinking, you know what? Fry bread, it smells so good. Like it just smells like when you smell it, it's like fry bread. Wouldn't fry bread make a great air freshener? You know, like, that gives me an idea. There, there are actually many uses, non-consumable uses of fry bread. Yeah. So like, you know, just like, just, it smells like fry bread, like fresh fried fry bread. Yeah, it, it, it makes a good fresh, uh, scent fresher, but you know, fry bread is very, uh, maybe not fry in the bathroom though. <laughs> no, no, that'd be weird. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it would be weird. Uh, that bathroom smells a lot like fry bread. <laughs> you know, why do we have to bring up the bathroom and fry bread right there? Cause I was about to say fry bread is actually Fairly absorb is actually very absorbent. Oh, okay. And I don't mean adult diapers when you pick up bathroom, but something okay. more uh something with a combustion engine. Yeah. Like uh, you know, fry bread actually makes a very good place to collect oil when you change your own oil on your vehicle. Well, you know what? That makes sense because you know, when you're if you have a fry bread that's old and it's been sitting around for a while, you know, like say you make a bunch of fry bread and you don't get a chance to eat them all. Yeah. Really good use for one. Absolutely. Do um, you have a use for fry bread? A non-consumable non -consumable use for fry bread? Yeah, you know, I was thinking that, you know, when fry bread gets old, like you could actually use it as like a Frisbee because it gets really hard. So yeah. you could just do like a Frisbee toss to each other. You could so have, absolutely, you could do fr fr uh, fry bread discus. Yes. You know, even if you use a dog to fry it, you better, you may worry it may not come back to you because the dog might take some bites out of it. Yeah, chip the tooth. But, you know, uh, when you're throwing discus, if the wind, the wind's blowing, it could go over, break a window or something. Which reminds me, if you got from fry bread that's getting kind of stale, there's another use. 
Wind chimes. Oh, that's really smart. Red wind chimes. Yes, you definitely would know the wind was going if you saw that moving around. Or who it's aiming away from. <laughs> nice. So All you right, your turn. What's 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 a what, what's a good use you have for a non-consumable use of fry bread? So you know how fry bread gets really hard, right? So I was thinking maybe it would be a good like you could use it like a Brillo pad and like a bathtub, like to clean it. That's a good idea. Um, that's a very good idea. Matter of fact, you could. I don't know. I'm flashing back to that commercial we did toward when we when the show was still fairly new. In our first few weeks, we did that commercial we debut, debuted Earl from Quarantinos, mm -hmm. and he talked about the uh, fry bread mucosal inserts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, fry bread is kind of cushy. It's actually pretty cushy. And I was thinking about that and I experimented. Y'all, I've talked about it on the show before. I like to kayak a lot. And uh, it reminded me that, and I tried this last weekend when I got done teaching kayaking. Kayak. But I actually took some fry bread and made a kayak seat cushion. Oh, that's smart. Just don't add powdered sugar or, or, or honey. Yeah, that might be a little weird. Before it is, it uses a seat cushion. <laughs> because things get weird yeah yeah just a little bit yep so you know i was thinking about you know fry bread kind of has like you know it gets really flat and you yeah. can actually make really big ones like you can actually make fry bread really big right and i was thinking what if you made a purse out of fry bread huh. i dig it i dig it kind of cool Fry bread can be a fashion accessory. Yes, exactly. Two pieces of fry bread back to back right there. Oh, make a fry bread purse. purse. And then when you get hungry, you're like. <laughs> Bingo. Uh, have you ever thought of a hat? A high fashion, high fashion, fat fry bread fashion Thank accessory? Hat. Oh, that's interesting. Well, actually, you don't know how, how square on you are. Take a look. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Ah, class fashion right there. And you know what? Fry bread is so organic, like just the shape of it. It's not very square, like a piece of bread. So yeah. you can get some really interesting hat shapes on that. Absolutely. You know, it, you can, I, I'm sure there's ways to make a top hat with it too. Oh yeah. That'd be Beated cool. Beaded fry bread top hat. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Beaded fry bread top hat. Well, people want to talk about, you know, having sustainable fashion trends. Yes, yes. And then there's these edible fashion trends. Mm hmm. Thumbs up right there. No, it's like the can, like the, you know, the candy jewelry. What? You know, like candy jewelry, you know, how like they have the candy that's on a string and you can. I got confused with that as a lot of kid and I had a big dental bill. <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. Kidding. You're like, yeah, a few of my teeth, like, they just didn't grow back. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Thank God they don't grow back. Okay. <laughs> um, this has been a fun show. I think we have one more. We have an official announcement for right now, right? Yes, yes. So we just wanted, you know, to announce again that the ASU powwow is going to be. Let me get up the slide. Let me get the slide. And here we go. Here we go. So the ASU powwow will return on April 8th, 9th, and 10th, 2022. So we're really excited about it. And I'm, I'm so excited to be going back to the ASU powwow in 2022. So it's going to be nice to see my powwow family. Absolutely. And, um, you know, that's the next week's for next week's show. We're going to be, uh, We'll be announcing it on Monday what what that is, but we want to definitely get this information out there and let everybody know ASU be back 2022. Yay! Awesomeness. All right, so that about wraps up the evening for us, right? Yes, it is. Yes, so okay. thank you so much for watching our show. Um, actually, it's interesting. This show is actually going to be uh, shared on Facebook on three different pages. It's going to be on Dancing Bear Indian Trader, Elk Rack Traders, and Pow Wow at ASU. So we have three, three different, oh, yeah. um, three different outlets. So if you didn't get a chance to before, 
make sure that you like and follow each of our pages, um, Dancing Bear Indian Trader, Elk Rack Traders, and Pow Wow at ASU. And uh, we actually post this video on um, YouTube and it's going to be on all of our um, channels, our pages. And uh, make sure that, you know, if you like what you saw, you know, you can check us out. Every Friday night we post a new video of you know fun and we have interesting guests and topics and whatnot that we talk about um on dancy beard and trader and elk rack traders absolutely and just to continue with tonight's theme is we will be we've been contacting some of the uh power committees that powers normally happen in the spring the spring gatherings that aren't able to have it happen a second year in a row now and we're all squaring away it cut we're coming back 2022 but we're going to be bringing over the next couple of months, we're going to be bringing on some of the members of those pow committees to talk about the respective powwows and what's special about them. I mean, every pow is special, but, you know, just talk about their, their journey, their story about their powwow and what, and their, when they, what, what we're all looking forward to with their pow and especially themselves mm -hmm. when they come back next spring. Yes. So yay, guys. I really appreciate you guys watching our show with us. I hope you had a little bit of fun with our powwow uh, fry bread um, bits that we do because we always like to do little comic comic bits on our show. And we thought it would be fun. <laughs> uh, we thought it would be fun to kind of talk about um, different fun uses for fry bread other than eating. So and eating. <laughs> We're ready. Yay! So thank you guys for watching. Everyone, thank you for watching. This has been another episode of Late Night Craft. Aw, ain't he cute? <laughs>